All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. Let's give the moms a big hand this morning. All right. God's worthy of our praise. And on a lower level, our moms, if they were good moms, they are worthy of our praise. Uh, I know that not everybody has a mom that brings good memories, but... Um, I just appreciate so much uh, all of the wonderful ladies here at our church, and especially the mothers. Brother Robert, I don't have, uh, I have this slide still on mine. Okay, <laughs> great. All right, this is the beginning. I'm going to start with a story this morning. Many years ago, a hurricane, as you can see, that's Florida there. And that hurricane is right on top of Florida there, a bad hurricane. Many years ago, a hurricane hit South Florida, and Norena Smith, Norena Smith. Oh, Robert, I don't have control. I'll grab it. Da -da -da -da. Okay, there she is. There's Norena. Okay, Norena Smith was one of the many people in Florida whose home was just horribly damaged. Many of them just had their homes wiped off of their foundation. But anyway, she got an insurance settlement and the repair work on her home began. But unfortunately, the uh, m money ran out and so did the contractor. <laughs> Anybody ever gone through that before? <laughs> well, anyway, um, she didn't get her electricity reconnected. And guess what? She didn't get it connected 15 days later or 15 months later. She went 15 years without electricity. Okay? She'd been living in the dark house for 15 years, no heat when the winter chill settled in over Florida. No air conditioning when the mercury climbed into the 90s and the humidity clung to 100%. Not one hot shower. Without money to finish the repairs, Norena just got by with a small lamp and a single burner. Her neighbors didn't seem to notice the absence of power. Acting on a tip, the mayor of Miami-Dade got involved. It only took a few hours of work by an electrical contractor to get the power returned to her house. Just a few hours. She was without power 15 years, but it only took a few hours to get it reconnected. And on the CBS News, they said that Norena plans to let the water get really hot. And then she's going to take her first bubble bath in a decade and a half. <laughs> this is what she said. She said, it's hard to describe having the electricity to switch on. It's overwhelming. It's hard to describe the electricity, having electricity to switch on. And I can imagine, because you know what, everybody, I don't know about you, every once in a while the power goes out in our house, okay? And, and you know, normally if, it's, if it goes out, hopefully it's only out for a minute or two. Sometimes it might be out for, I don't know, 30 minutes. But I don't, I don't remember it being out longer, much longer than that, though some of you and where you live may have had to endure a day or two. Now, again, wouldn't you all agree with me that if we lost power, say, 15 days, that we would be hurting really badly? Yeah, because, you know, like not too long ago, our refrigerator, the freezer, went on the fritz, and so I, uh, I went to... You know what you can do? You know, it's, it's even better than buying ice. I went to Walmart, and they have dry ice. It's nine degrees below zero, and you can't even hold it with your hands. It'll destroy your hands, so you have to wear gloves. But I put that dry ice in coolers, and man, let me tell you something. That kept the stuff we had in the freezer fine, because it took me like five days to get it. So I put dry ice in the refrigerator on the right side, and I put dry ice in the... Uh, in the um, uh, coolers, and you know what? That dry ice, man, that stuff worked wonderfully. And when it melts, it doesn't water. It doesn't. It doesn't leave water behind because it's dry. And so uh, that was really an awesome fix there. 
But I kept trying to, you know, I'm cheap, I'm a cheapskate. I didn't want to hire a repairman. You know, I'm like, man, if I hire a repairman, then it's going to cost me. So I'm on the internet, okay, how do you fix the freezer? And, and, and no kidding, no kidding. This one guy is on there, you know, he's probably from like Timbuktu, Texas. He's like, now if, you're, if your refrigerator sounded like this, and he puts a noise on it, he's got a microphone, he's putting it down by the refrigerator, and it's making the noise. I said, that's what mine sounds like, he says. He said, you just need a new motherboard, order a motherboard. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that won't come. I'm, I'm going online and getting a motherboard for it, and it's like a computer board. And they said, It'll take till next week. We can't get it to you by Friday. We can't get it to you because it was Thursday. You're going to have to wait till Monday or Tuesday. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Because, you know, it had been out for two days already. So finally what happened, I found a company that day on Thursday in Illinois that the only company in America that would overnight the motherboard. And they got it to me on Friday at lunchtime. Man, that UPS truck pulled up. I was in my office studying. I looked over there. Yes! And so, man, they brought that thing, and I pulled that refrigerator out from the wall, and I pulled that motherboard out of there, and it had like, it had like 15 wires I had to reconnect, so I, I took a picture of it with my phone, so I knew right where to put the wires. I'm looking at my phone. Okay, that one goes there, that one, okay. And then I connected it, and I'm like, okay, Lord, <laughs> Lord, I can't, I can't. you got to fix it this time. And so I went around to the front, and... Uh, and I, I plugged it in, nothing, nothing. I'm like, okay, what do I do? So then I went to the ice maker on the front, and I started pushing buttons, and that thing started whirling, and it worked. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I just saved $500. Woo! So anyway... So it, it worked. I couldn't believe it. But uh, I'm a cheapskate like that. You know, I'll, I'll do dry ice for a few days to try to fix it on my own. And then if it worse comes to worse, then I'll turn to somebody and, and with my teeth gritted, pay them to fix my fridge. <laughs> but that was, I was thankful that that all worked out. That was an unusual thing. But you know what? You and I can all agree. When the power goes out... It's no fun, and especially like if your refrigerator, your freezer, or something in the garage goes out, it's a, a nightmare. And you know what? I bring that up because, you know, we're doing this series on the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I'm just wondering is if in your mind and in your heart, I just wonder if sometimes you don't think in your own life. I know I think about that, this, but you just wonder sometimes if the power's gone out <laughs> in a spiritual way. In our lives, has the power gone out? Are we missing something? Is, are, are we not connecting? You know, is the plug not getting plugged? You know, whenever people, you know, like sometimes people call me, hey, Pastor Bob, I can't get my computer working. I said, did you kick the cord out of the wall? Oh, no, but I kick the, I, my foot kick the, 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 you know, what do you call the, the little uh, thing you got six plug-ins? Yeah, the power strip. Yeah, my foot brushed the power strip and the orange light went off. Now I turned it back. Yeah, okay, thank you, Pastor Bob. Okay. The first thing you start with is the power, right? You don't say, okay, well, here, open this up or turn this program on, because if there's no power, you know, it reminds me of a, I remember when computers first came on the scene many, many years ago, and they showed this one funny uh, picture I saw was of an elderly lady, and she was trying to fix her computer, but she was holding her computer mouse like it was a remote control, and she was pointing it toward the, t to the, toward the monitor, and she was thinking her mouse was like a, com like a uh, TV remote, but she found out, no, you slide it around on the, on the thing, but anyway, I thought that was a pretty funny uh, Pretty funny cartoon. But anyway, but sometimes the power goes out, right? We get disconnected, and we start thinking, Lord, you know what? I need to reconnect. I need to get the power going again. And, you know, sometimes this is how we feel. You know, we sometimes we feel that uh, we've lost power, and, you know, we're horrified, you know, and we, we don't want to uh, go through that, and we just need to get things reconnected. And this morning, so what I'm going to talk to you about, maybe you in your mind, you're thinking you might have lost power. Well, you know what? This morning the topic is, and I haven't spoken all the way since January, 
because there's just so many things you could talk about the Holy Spirit. But this morning, I just want to talk about power. I want to talk about the power of the Spirit because the Bible talks about the power of the Holy Spirit. All right? All right, so let's bow our heads for prayer, and then we'll get right into this. Father, use this in all of our lives because, Lord, the world around us is, is, is becoming worse and worse. They're more and more in need of what we have. They need their creator. They need their maker. They need the one that put them together. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll use this in our lives because, Lord, I know that these people want the power. They want to know God's power in their life and see it making an impact in the lives of other people. So use this in our lives, Father. Use your word. Let it be powerful in our hearts. And we pray it in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right. Listen, I love thunderstorms. You might hate thunderstorms. Or like, you know, like people that are on airplanes. When I'm on airplanes, I always feel, hear people like get real afraid when, when there's a storm or like there's like a, uh, there's turbulence. You know, and, and they're like, ah! You know, you'll hear people do that. And, and, you know, I have to admit, I haven't always been perfectly calm during turbulence because sometimes I've been in really bad turbulence. Remember one time our former pastor Earl Little and I were coming back from Iowa, and, man, we were getting tossed around. And uh, you know what? For, for a minute there I looked over and Earl was missing. I thought he went out the window or something, you know. And, but anyway... Um, Sometimes it could get really bad, but you know what? Down here on earth, like one time I remember walking my doggy, Fendi, my little doggy. She's getting old. She's got, um, she's got, uh, uh, I have to give her insulin, diabetes. She's got diabetes. And I was out walking her one night, and God began to light the sky up, not near us, but far away. But man, I mean the lightning. I took my phone and started filming that lightning. It was just beautiful. It was like this, but even better. It was like all across the sky, but far away, like 20 miles away. In fact, it was so far, I didn't, I didn't even hear any thunder. It, it, the thunder just couldn't even make it to where I was at. But it was gorgeous. It was just beautiful. But you know what? I just like... Now, I have to admit, I don't want somebody that doesn't live very far from me got hit by lightning, and it destroyed their entire house. They had to live like in a hotel for like a year and a half until it was completely finished. But, you know, I, I don't want my house to ever get hit by lightning, but I like the thunderstorms because I just think, I just love when, first of all, you got the light, right? And then, four seconds, five seconds, it depends on how far away the lightning is. If you go one, one thousand two 1,000, three 1,000, and then your house starts shaking, that means it was 30 miles away. I think that's right. Is it three miles? Three miles, thank you. Three miles. So that's how far it is. Every, every second is how many miles from the time it lights up until the time you hear it. One time I was on the phone with Brother Bill, Brother Wade, sitting here about 15 years ago. We have an ailing steeple right now. This one got blown over by the wind. But I was on the phone with Brother Bill, and it was so dark. And then all of a sudden, there was this massive flash of light. And I, had, I happened to have my, my uh, blinds open. And I'm not kidding. There was not a chance to count to one, because it was flash, boom! Whoa! Simultaneously. And I said, wow, did you hear that, Brother Bill? He said, no. I said, oh, there's just a mess. And you know what? It hit our steeple, and it split it like a banana peel. Man, it, half of it was hanging down this side, half was hanging down this side. But the last time we put the new steeple up, we put a lightning strike thing in there. A big cable, so in case it gets hit, it goes down through the ground. But man, let me tell you something. I love these thunderstorms. Why? Why do you like thunderstorms, Pastor Bob? Because you know what? I know the one who's behind those storms. And it reminds me that, you know what, the God that I serve, the God that you serve, he's not weak. He's not uh, a million miles away. He's very, very powerful. I want you to see this verse from Job. And I took this from the New Living Translation because it's a powerful translation of what's being said here. And Job said, listen carefully to the thunder 
That's what hits your house and shakes your house. That's the thunder. The lightning is the light, the and the loud noise and the rumbling of your house and the shaking of your house. That's the thunder. Listen carefully to the thunder of God's voice as it rolls from his mouth. It rolls across the heavens and his lightning flashes in every direction. Then comes the roaring of the thunder, the tremendous voice of his majesty. So what Job is saying is God is powerful like thunder and lightning is. When he speaks, it's like shaking your house. God is so mighty. Then comes the roaring of the thunder, the tremendous voice of his majesty. He does not restrain it when he speaks. God's voice is glorious in thunder. We can't even imagine the greatness of his power. Did you see that last line? You and I can't even imagine. I guess so. I guess so, because this universe right now is a, close to 14 billion light years across. You say, Pastor Bob, how far is 14 billion light years? Okay, get in a car that's going 186,000 miles per second. I didn't say per hour. I said 186,000 miles per second. And start driving at that speed and drive for 14 billion years at that speed. That's how large our universe is. Now, folks, if our God is maintaining a universe and keeping it all in perfect balance, he doesn't allow the sun to get too close to earth where we get fried. He doesn't allow the sun to get too far away from earth where we turn into icicles. God is maintaining it with perfection and his power. I think a God that could speak a universe that currently is 14 billion light years across is a very, very powerful. And not only speak it into existence to create it out of nothing, but to maintain it for all these years. That's a powerful, powerful God. All right? Yes. <laughs> Praise God. All right. So let's look at this. Real quickly, I'm going to give you three points, and then the fourth point is our takeaway. But I want to first talk about the Godhead. I want to talk about God and His power, Christ and His power, the Spirit and His power. Just look at a few verses. For since the creation of the world, power, number one, power is one of God's attributes. It's one of His characteristics, okay? God is powerful. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, notice his invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. His eternal power, it's eternal. He has always been powerful, and he always will be powerful. He's going to allow evil people on earth, he's going to allow them to do the things that they want to do, but one day the hammer is going to come down. And life on earth, as it currently exists, will be over. And God will return, and he will take over in person, through the person of our Lord Jesus. Okay? People think they can get away with murder, but they don't realize there's a mighty God that sees everything that they do. He has eternal power. The, his attributes, his eternal power, and God... What does that mean, Godhead? It simply means his deity, his divinity, the fact that he's God Almighty. His power and the fact that he is the creator God, so that they are without excuse. Okay? What this verse is saying is, listen, rational people can look at the world... They can see the storms. They can see the hurricanes, the tornadoes, the lightning storms, the thunderstorms. They could see the produce. They can see the mountains. They could see all of the good things that come from the hand of God. And logical people will say, that didn't just happen. It didn't come from aliens, from another outer space. God, when the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it's obvious that he did it. And logical people will say, yes, there is an intelligent designer who designed all this, who, who keeps it all together, who, who has been feeding people for thousands and thousands of years and taking care of people, good and bad. The Bible says, Jesus said, he, he, he causes his rains, 
his rain to fall on the good and the bad, the just and the unjust. So God has been providing for mankind in his power. And that's why all these things that we can see with our eyes, even though it's God's invisible attributes, but we're seeing God through what we can see, that's why it says they're without excuse. There's no excuse. Uh, people have to do this. They have to push God away. They have to push the truth away and say, no, nah, we, we came from an amoeba. We came from a, the primordial soup. We weren't created. There's no creator. I don't have to give an account to anybody. I'm going to live and I'm going to die and I'm going to turn into dust. They don't believe in God. Well, they have to push all the things that they see with their eyes. Okay? That's God. How about... Oh, did I get the verse? I guess I didn't put the verse in from Jeremiah. Let me just read you the verse from Jeremiah. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, God has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom. And he has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. Did you hear that? Made the earth by his power. He established the world by his wisdom. There's his intelligence. And he stretched out the heavens at his discretion. So that's an attribute of God. Now what about the Lord Jesus? Does the Bible say the Lord Jesus has power? Yes, he does. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, the power, he spoke of the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ had power. Hey, when's the last time you healed blind eyes? When's the last time you raised somebody from the dead? When's the last time you caused people that were sick for 16 years to be instantly healed? When did you raise Lazarus from the dead? See, Jesus did things with his mighty power, okay? Um, and guess what? When he returns... They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great glory and power because Jesus is coming back to earth. And they're not going to see Jesus coming waving a feather duster. <laughs> Who's that, the Pillsbury Doughboy? No, the Pillsbury Doughboy with a, with a uh, feather duster in his hand isn't going to come out of the skies. The Bible says the world is going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. By the way, the cloud riders... From time immortal, even in false religions, fake religions, idol-worshiping religions, their gods were cloud riders. And the Bible calls God a cloud rider because that's how the ancient people pictured God Almighty as riding on the clouds because he's not man, he's God, and he can do that. So Jesus is literally going to come in the clouds around the earth with great Power, great power. And by the way, glory means brightness. Man, he's going to light up the entire earth with his glory. We're going to touch on that in just a minute. What about the Holy Spirit? Yes, the Bible talks about often the power of the Holy Spirit. And by the way, if you're here today and you know that you're saved, you know that you're on your way to heaven, if you have put your faith in Jesus and in Him alone for eternal life, then the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Spirit of God lives inside of every one of us that have put our faith in Jesus. We've trusted in Christ for His gift of eternal life. You've taken it as a gift by faith. Then the Holy Spirit lives in you. And in the Old Testament, let me just spend a minute on the Old Testament, because you got this word, and it says there, I don't know if you can see it, it says it's used 31 times in the Old Testament. The Spirit of God came upon so-and-so. The Spirit of God came upon him. The Bible says about Samson twice, the Spirit of God came mightily upon him. Only person, two times, the only person is Samson, that he came mightily upon, it says. Interesting. But that's used 31 times in the Old Testament. And I was going to say this. There's a study Bible, the Faith Life Study Bible, down on the bottom. It says, in the Old Testament, this phrase is used to describe people who are unable to perform divinely appointed tasks. When God, they didn't have Bibles then. They didn't have an Old Testament. They didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have Bibles to read and hear God's voice. So what God would do is he would 
put the Spirit upon somebody. The Holy Spirit came upon David, and he spoke God's words to God's people. The Holy Spirit came on Moses. You got all these people the Spirit is coming upon, and so they're prophesying. They're giving God's word directly from God. God is going through that person through the Holy Spirit's power. Okay? Other times, you know, the Spirit of God was on David and he killed Goliath. Okay, you get the idea. Okay? So the Holy Spirit, 31 times it says that, that the Spirit did that in the Old Testament. Jesus, in the New Testament, then Jesus returned in the, in the power of of the Spirit to Galilee. Now, this is right after he was tempted for 40 days. Now, we're only told that he was tempted three times, but another gospel says that he was tempted for 40 days. Matthew just gives you three of the temptations. But the Bible says Satan was tempting. Jesus wasn't drinking water, and he wasn't eating for 40 days. So obviously he had divine help there. We can't go 40 days without water. But God was intervening on his behalf, and he, as a human being, he fought Satan's temptations, and he was victorious. He didn't give in. And after that was over for 40 days, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. So as a human being, not as God, of course, Jesus was the God-man. He was simultaneously 100% God, simultaneously 100% man. But as a human, he needed, just like you and I need, the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? In Acts, uh, it tells us that uh, Jesus promised... I don't know if you could read that. I guess you can read that. But you will receive power. Jesus promised his disciples, hey, just wait for it. It's coming. It's coming. It's going to be here before you know it. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay? Now, I do admit that this is talking about the Holy Spirit coming and he was going to indwell them. But guess what? Not only did the Holy Spirit simultaneously come to live inside of those people on Pentecost, but they, it said flames of fire that looked like tongues were on top of all of their heads, the 120 disciples. And so they knew the Spirit came. God gave them a visual. You know, if the Spirit came upon them, and God didn't give them the symbol, they wouldn't have known it. They didn't have a Bible telling them about that. All they had was Jesus' promise. So he gave them an outward symbol. And so the Holy Spirit's in them and on them. And they began to speak in foreign languages. And the 3,000 people at Pentecost couldn't believe it because they were saying, I can hear in my own language about the wonderful works of God. These people, I'm hearing my own language because they were all over the earth. Well, that was the power of the Spirit, all right, doing that. Okay, Romans 15 says that you and I, when we have a walk of faith with God, without faith it's impossible to please God. You've got to have faith. You've got to be believing. You can abound in hope. Hey, do you want to abound in depression or do you want to abound in hope? You can abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we need the power for. Without faith, it's impossible. You won't have the power of the Spirit unless you trust in God. If you're gonna, you know what? If you focus on your, you draw a circle around yourself and you focus on, oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my, and you just focus on all your troubles, you're not walking by faith. People have depression either because their meds are all messed up, they have meds they're taking, and it's making them be depressed, or they're not, they're not trusting in God. They're focusing on themselves and that selfishness, and they're not pleasing God, and that's another, you know, another reason is lack of faith. Jesus chided people all the time, O oh, ye of little faith. O oh, ye of little faith. Okay? So that is our study. The first three points about the, the God, the Lord Jesus, the Spirit. What about our lives? Okay, this is what we're going to finish with. What about our lives? What about the power of the Spirit in our daily lives? Okay, well, first of all, this is awesome. He gives us power to witness. We looked at Acts 1.8, and I want to look at another verse. By the way, that guy there on the left, that's a friend of mine that's in the Ph.D. program at Liberty. His name's Peter, and that's him at uh, 
uh, the University of Southern Florida, I believe. It's near where he lives. And he goes out there and he puts up that little chalkboard. And on the chalkboard, he puts different questions. This one says, are people good? And he has two chairs. And there's a bench nearby, too. And he, says, he writes on the board and he just sits there. And people that are walking across the campus, they'll come and they'll sit down and say, well, are people good? <laughs> and he'll start having a conversation. Hey, this guy's got seven children, seven kiddos, and yet he carves out time to go to the university and sit there, and he just waits for students to come, and he talks to students all the time, and he gets onto the subject of the Lord. But just a simple question, are people good? And he uses other questions. He puts other questions on there. Does God exist? And so he'll just tweak people's brains, okay? So anyway, he's a witness. In Romans 15, 19, Paul said that by the power of God, he did mighty signs and wonders. God gave Paul miraculous power, okay? By the power of the Spirit. He had that by the power of the Spirit. And he said it's because of that he was able to fully preach the gospel of Christ. He could share it because God's power was working within him. Obviously, we don't work miracles. Obviously, we don't, you know, Jesus healed the blind and he healed the deaf and he healed people that were crippled and he raised people from the dead. Listen, we don't have those things today. You and I personally can't do those. It doesn't say that God can't heal blind people. God could do it. But he doesn't give you and I the power to do that. But listen to me. We can make an impact on other people. Okay? We can make an impact on other people. I love this verse in Luke. Behold, I send the promise of my Father. Who's that? Who's the promise of the Father? The Holy Spirit, right? I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I'm going to send my spirit to you, but you've got to wait for him. But guess what, everybody? Today, the power plant is living inside of us. But you know what's happened today? We've gotten disconnected from it. You remember the Lord Jesus says, without me you can do nothing? Hey, is the Holy Spirit in us? Yeah, but if you're not connected to God, to God the Lord Jesus, to God the Holy Spirit, if you're not close, you've pulled the plug or you've scraped your foot against the power strip and the power has gone off. And that's why we got to stay close to the Spirit. The power plants in us, but if we're disconnected, we don't have the power. Okay, so that's number one. He's given us power as we speak to others. So let me just say this very quickly. I wrote this down in my notes. You'll never witness until you realize the powerful Spirit of God is with you every step of the way. We share the Word. The Spirit does the work. Did you hear that? We share the Word with others the Spirit does the work. So guess what? You just share Christ. Just praise God to other people. Tell people how much you love the Lord and how good He is to you and talk about His wondrous deeds and about His ways and about the gospel. And guess what? Let the Holy Spirit's power do the work. All right? That's the answer. Okay, quickly, number two. He not only enables us to witness to others, He enables you and I to help others. Look at what it says about Jesus in Acts chapter 10. Jesus was anointed, or Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with Him. Hey, listen, I realize Jesus was casting out demons and things like that, but guess what, everybody? Even though you and I aren't casting demons literally out of people, where I mean where they are actually inside of people, and Jesus said, hey, what's your name? Come out of that person. Guess what? We still can set people free from the devil through the power of the Holy Spirit. Hey, you're looking at a person right here that was set free from the devil through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right here. Right here. You know what? I was bound in sin. Sin had its chains all around me, but one day I got saved, and then one day I learned that the Holy Spirit was living inside of me, and by the power of the Spirit, those chains were broken. And, but you know what else it took? It took help 
from my mentor. It took help from Scott Reese and Jim Blaylock and the guys that were around me at work when I first got saved. They were encouragers to me. And we could be like Jesus, and we can encourage other people toward God. And we can help break the chains that Satan has around them. God can use you to do that. And that's what we need to say, Lord, I need your power. Lord, you're my power plant. I'm trusting in you, Lord. Spirit of God to flow through me. And as I encourage people, as I teach other people, as I love other people, that it impacts them. And it has a powerful impact on their lives. All right? So that's number two. Number three. Oh, I'm not to number three yet. I like this verse in Colossians 1. To this end, Paul said, to this goal, I also labor. So he's working hard. I labor, striving according to his working. I'm laboring here on earth, but I'm doing it according to his working, which works in me mightily. He's saying, yeah, I'm having to get on ships and go long distances and go without food and sometimes without water and and sometimes without money, and I'm paying a price to do this. And so I'm laboring on the outside, but guess what? I'm doing it according to his power in me that's working through me. That's why I can start churches, Paul said, all over the world. He is trusted in the power of God. You see that, everybody? You can't live disconnected from the power. We, you and I, need God's power. Mark it down. We're not going to be the the spouses we need to be. We're not going to be the parents we need to be. We're not going to be the grandparents we need to be. We're not going to be the employees we need to be. We're not going to be the co-workers we need to be, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We've got to have it. We've got to have it. Finally, let me give you one more. Oh, thank you, Lord. We already gave sermons on this, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. But everybody, okay, everybody is somewhere spiritually. Some people are here. Some people have gotten down the road a little more. They're here. Some people are over here. They're, they're stronger. But wherever we're at, man, you may be over here today. You may not even be a believer today. Maybe today will be the day that you get saved and you put your faith in Christ and you become a child of God. Through simple faith, just saying, Lord, I'm lost. I'm on my way way to eternity without you. And Lord, I need eternal life, and I trust in you to give me what only you could give me, eternal life. You could do that today. So you're starting fresh, but you got a lot of chains on you. Well, the Bible says God is the one, the Spirit of God is the one who enables us to be holy. Romans 1, 4, the very beginning of the book of Romans, which says so much about getting set free from evil. Jesus is declared, Romans 1, 4, just four verses into this long letter. He's declared, declared, shouted aloud that he's the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness. He's the son. Hey, listen, I told you our God was powerful. And in Romans, God's saying, God's saying, I can give you the power. I can give you the power. And it's through my spirit. And he can set you free and make you holy. Are you tied up in sin? God will set you free from it. I don't care what it is. He can set you free. This is my mentor, Zane Hodges. He, He was a blessing to me for 22 years until the Lord took him home. And I tried to help him in every way that I could in those 22 years and got to rub shoulders with him a lot and ate lunch with him a lot and picked his brain a lot. But now he's in heaven, man, I still wish he was alive. But you know what? In his commentary on Romans, this is what he wrote about that verse. The Holy Spirit is the divine agent, both in the resurrection of Jesus. In other words, the agent is the one that God's using. You know, like an insurance agent, the insurance company sends an agent out. The Spirit is the divine agent, both in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and also in the spiritual resurrection. See, We need to be resurrected spiritually. We need to become more and more like Christ. We need to have more holiness. And he is the agent. There's no other way. And earlier in this series, I told you how how we do that. We take God's word and we look into God's word, the mirror. And the spirit transforms us from glory 
to glory were transformed even as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's, the, you, it's you taking the Word of God seriously and two, letting the Spirit do His work. That's how you become holy. Listen, when I got saved, Friday nights, Saturday nights, Sunday nights, you know what I used to do all weekend long, three nights every weekend? Drink. Do drugs. Get high. I did that for years as a teenager. But then God saved me. And you know what? It didn't take very long before I quit going there. So now I'm staying home. And I'm in the basement of my mom and dad's house. But you know what I did? I said, you know what? I need to learn the Bible. And I took my Bible out Friday night. Three, four, five hours studying it. Saturday night. Sunday night. Well, of course, on Sunday night, I went to church, started going to church. But all that to say, everybody, is I was transformed by God's Word. It's what, it's what caused the chains to start dropping off because I got serious about it. And we've got to be serious about God's Word, everybody. Ephesians 3, I love this. Okay, so here we're talking about you and I becoming holy, but there's one more thing I want to say, and then I'll, I'll close with a story. There's not just personal holiness in our own hearts, in our own minds. There's not just personal holiness God wants, whether anybody's there or not. He wants you to be holy whether people are looking or whether they're not looking. But guess what? We're a family. Do I hear amen? amen. This is a great family. You know what? We get along. We love each other here. Everybody's accepted. We love people. You come into Ridgepoint, we're going to love you into the kingdom and into holiness. But what I'm saying is there's something to be said about a church. Hey, by the way, you know what, everybody? There's a lot of churches that don't have that. They don't have unity. They don't have oneness. You know what? They have this. People fighting one another. People wanting to be in control. I want to decide. And then people fighting. It's a terrible it's terrible. But you know what? Did you know that the book of Ephesians says God not only wants us holy as individuals, He wants us holy at a church, as a church? The Bible says in Ephesians 3 that Paul's praying that the Ephesian church, that they would be strengthened with might, strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner man. Now, is he talking about the inner man of each person? Well, in other places he has, but not here. He's talking about the inner man of the body, the church family, all of us together, that, that persona, as it were, as we're together as a family, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Now, I put in red, y'alls. Because <laughs> when we read our English Bible, it's not like Greek. They should have put in the English Bible, y'all, because that means everybody. It's plural in Greek. It's plural. When you read a Greek Bible, you see it right away. Paul says, that Christ may dwell in y'all's hearts. In other words, I want Christ abiding in you as a body, all of you. That, you may, that Christ may dwell in y'all's hearts through faith, that y'all, verse 19, may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's corporate holiness. God's not just interested in having solid, holy, devout believers out on job sites and in neighborhoods all over Dallas. He wants that. But he also wants there to be a body that when people come in, they say, you know what? There's something different about this place. There's something different. Man, people came in, and I almost got my arms shaken off by the handshakes and by the hugs and all. You know what I'm saying? That's what we need to be. We need to be as a body. We need to be one. We need to be holy as a body. We, we need to have unity. Get along. We're fighting, for the same, we're fighting the same battles, God's battles. We're glorifying Him. All right. Let me go ahead and close with a story, all right? This is a slide of Roger Clemens. When I was uh, 
a lot younger. Roger Clemens was a, an amazing, amazing pitcher for many different teams. He pitched for New York. He pitched for the Red Sox. Pitched for several different teams. But I think his heyday was with the Red Sox. And, you know, uh, he made the All-Star team right away because he was such a great pitcher. Okay? Well, the All-Star game on July 15, 1986, he was the starting pitcher. And he had a sizzling fastball. I mean, man, when he threw, I mean, he threw hard. But guess what? He wasn't the only one that threw hard because on the National League side in the All-Star game, there was Dwight Gooden. And Dwight Gooden had a smoking fast fastball that it would go so fast. You know, you're talking about going over 100 miles an hour, everybody. So you're standing there with a stick. And here comes this ball so fast. I mean, you've only got microseconds to react. I mean, it just... And so... In this All-Star game, Roger Clemens, all during the, during the season, he's on an American League team. He's on the Boston Red Sox. They have designated hitters. The pitchers never bat. They never go up to bat during the regular season. But in the World Series and in the playoffs and in the All-Star games, when they're playing against uh, National League teams, they've got to go up to bat. So here's Roger Clemens. He probably hasn't batted since college days, maybe not even that, and he goes up to bat against Dwight Gooden. And he's standing there, you know, I mean, it's just kind of like a four-year-old standing there. Cause, and so Dwight Gooden sits there and he, just, he throws a fastball that basically burned Roger Clemens' nose hairs out of his nose. It hit that catcher's glove, and man, he stepped out of the batter's box with his bat, and he looked over to Gary Carter. Gary Carter was a devout believer. He's in heaven now. He died of cancer several years back at a young age, at a fairly young age, in his 60s. And um, he stepped out of the batter's box, and Roger Clemens asked him this, and that's Gary Carter. This is on a baseball card. He said, is that what my pitches look like? And Gary Carter said, you bet it is. You bet it is. In other words, yep, Gary Carter was sitting back there behind home plate, and when he stepped out of the batter's box and asked him that question, man, do I throw that hard? He said, yes, you do. Yes, you do. He said, Pastor Bob, why do you say that? Well, here's a baseball card. He was, the, by the way, he pitched three perfect innings. He didn't in the all-star. He's, pe he's pitching against the best batters in baseball. He didn't allow one walk. He didn't allow one hit for three innings. He pitched nine batters and put them all out, whether by strikeouts or by, you know, flyouts or groundouts. Nobody got a hit off. And he was named as, like, I think he was only in the league one or two years at this point. He might have been a rookie. But he was named the MVP in 1986. And after that was all over, with a fresh reminder, this is what I wrote in my notes, with a fresh reminder of how overpowering a good fastball is, Clemens said he pitched from that day on. He pitched from that day on with far greater boldness because he realized just how hard he could throw. He pitched with far greater boldness. And by, my, by the way, my friends, do you know how we're going to live with far greater boldness for God? Hey, how many will admit, I'll put my hand up first, how many admit that everybody in God's kingdom needs more boldness for God in the world we live in, huh? Yeah, we all do. We're all like, yes, I need that. Well, the where we start is we realize just who lives inside of us. God Almighty, El Gibor, the mighty God, the Holy Spirit of God. He lives in us. We've got God's powerhouse living inside of us, God's power plant. And so everybody, you know what? Lift up prayer to God and say, Lord, by your Spirit, make me bolder for your glory. Let me talk. I should, I should be singing your praises to the people in the world around me. What's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? You know where I'm coming from, everybody? Hey, listen. The world's not getting better around us. It's getting worse. And folks, we're the answer. We, I'm, let me put it this way. We've got the answer. We're the answer in the sense we have to witness and share Christ. But Jesus is the answer. 
You know, when my wife Kelly was growing up, her dad owned a giant uh, sheetrock uh, business in, in building supply business, Ypsilanti, Michigan. And on the side, after he got saved in 1959, on the side of his business, he put up this giant sign. It was probably 20 feet wide and about 3 foot tall. And it said, Christ is the answer. Christ is the answer. He wasn't ashamed. When people were coming into his place, they knew they were coming to talk with a Christian man about buying building supplies. Christ is the answer. If he's the answer, then you know what you and I need to be doing? We need to be trusting in him more to give us more opportunities through his power to give the good news. And then, Jesus went about doing good, right? To be helping people who are bound by Satan low these many years to set them free by your encouragement, by your kindness, by your love. God needs you. God needs you. Jesus is in here on earth. He sent his spirit to live in us so we could all be little Jesuses going out around the world. He needs you and I, everybody. Now the question is, will we be the people God wants us to be? You know what, everybody? A lot of preachers give up. A lot of preachers give up and throw in the towel because they say, you know what, these people aren't listening to me. I'm going to go somewhere else. Unfortunately, they go somewhere else and they found out, oh, these people aren't listening to me. And then they go somewhere else. Oh, these people aren't listening to me. And they go, listen, you know what? I've always believed that our church with God, all of us and God make a majority. You and God, guess what? You make a majority. Because when you have God, you have everything you need. And you know what? I still think the days of our church, August, the first Sunday in August, our founding pastor is going to come here and he's going to speak on that day. And Pastor Little, our second pastor, he's going to come and talk before the offertory and pray. And we're going to have the original pastors. You know what? Listen, everybody. Uh, I'm telling you, we're going to have our 30th, 30th anniversary as a church. But you know what? I believe in the days ahead that we can have our greatest days ahead. You say, how's that, Pastor Bob? Things are getting so bad, nobody wants to hear about Jesus anymore. Guess what? If we become the people God wants us to be, you, you wouldn't believe what God could use us to do. So you know what? Keep your chin up. Keep your chin up. You know what? You know why I haven't thrown in the towel? Why I haven't left Ridge Point a long time ago? Because... First of all, there's no, it's, it's silly. <laughs> it's silly to say, well, they won't listen to me. I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, they're not going to listen to you over there either a lot of the time. So that's kind of a silly thing. I've seen that happen where they just keep going from church to church. That doesn't, you know what? I, I say, hey, let's build God's word in people over time. Let's keep feeding them. Keep strengthening them. Hey, if, if, if someone's a little weak spiritually, if you keep feeding them the word of God, they, they'll get strong. And I think they have. I've seen so many young people, so many kids, so many parents, so many people go from here to here spiritually because of the Word of God. Not because of me, because of God's Spirit and God's Word. It's always, Christ is always the answer. The Spirit's always the answer. All right? So let's bow our heads for prayer, everybody. Now with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I just want you to think for just a minute on this Mother's Day, on this day we celebrate moms. And thank God for my mom's 92. Glory to God. 92, still, still kicking. And just praise the Lord for my mom. I talked to her on the phone. She says, Bob, I couldn't have asked for a better son than you. <laughs> I said, I know. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But anyway, this is the day that we focus on moms and thank God for them. But on this day, before we go out and celebrate our moms, I want you just to think about you and God. Now, maybe some of you are here, and like I said earlier, you're not even sure you're going to be with God when you die. All right? Well, you see me after the service. Say, Pastor Bob, you know what? I really want to know for sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven, and I could show you right from the Bible. I'll just take a few minutes. I'll stay here. I'll answer every question you've got. But those of you that know God and you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, are you hungry for the power of the Spirit? Are you hungry for Him to use you like never before? Are you? 
Do you in your work, in your neighborhood, everywhere you go, do you want God, do you want to show people the power of God and the greatness of God? Father, we all pray that you'll give us boldness like never before. Lord, this week even, start opening doors for us to start sharing the good news with people. If there's somebody that's in really bad straits, help us to see all that we can do to help get them on the straight and narrow road, Lord. Give us your strength and your grace. Bless us as a church family, Lord, in the days ahead. Let our church prosper like never before, Lord. Let us see great and mighty things that we do not know. Lord, you can do it because you're awesome. We ask all these things in your precious name. Amen.